I always thought of Warren Buffett as the world's best investor. He's a self-made billionaire and built his net worth of over $108 billion over almost 60 years by consistently picking the right stocks and companies to invest in. Take a look at the world's richest billionaires. Everyone at the top either built a tech company or inherited a huge business from their family. But Buffett got there simply by understanding the stock market and making the right call for years. But what most people don't know is that there was another investor who was even better than Buffett at picking stocks and reading the market. Buffett actually obsessively studied his game, Dr. Henry Singleton. As founder of the conglomerate Teledyne from 1963 to 1990, Singleton bought and invested in more than 130 companies. Over Buffett's investing career, he's recorded a 20.1% compound annual return for his investors. Singleton clocked in at 20.4%. To visualize how insane that figure is, if you invested $1 in the S&P 500 index in 1963, and got a solid 8% annual compounding interest rate. By 1990, you'd have $7.99. But if you invested $1 with Singleton instead, then by 1990, you'd have $150.28. That's 19 times better than the S&P 500, and a bit better than Buffett whose 20.1% return would give you $140.50. Buffett has actually said that he considers Dr. Henry Singleton of Teledyne to have the best operating and capital deployment record in American business history. And if you combined the top 100 business school graduates, their records would still pale in comparison to Singleton's. So let's break down exactly what made Singleton so good and the three things that Buffett took and used in his own business empire. Henry Singleton did not have a normal business background by any stretch of the imagination. While Warren Buffett was buying his first stocks at 11 years old, Singleton was studying advanced math, getting a PhD in engineering, and programming the first computer at MIT in the 1930s. After graduating, he developed a system for removing magnetic fields from American ships during World War II so they wouldn't be detected by German submarines. And Singleton never actually ran a company until he was 44 years old, which is amazing when you consider how successful he went on to be. In 1960, Singleton founded the technology company Teledyne, which produced niche electrical equipment. But Singleton had no intentions of staying niche. He wanted to turn Teledyne into a conglomerate, the same structure Buffett has built with Berkshire Hathaway. Teledyne would use its excess cash flow to acquire additional companies. Teledyne ended up acquiring 130 companies over the next decade, focusing on aviation electronics, specialty metals, and insurance. And Singleton's number one investment priority was to only buy businesses that had rock-solid long-term value. Singleton never bought unsuccessful companies for cheap prices and tried to turn them around. Instead, he focused on profitable, growing companies with leading market shares, often in specific, narrow niches. He was never interested in grabbing a stock with the intention of making a short-term buck. Everything was oriented around holding for the long term and allowing his companies to compound. He actually hated that quick buy and flip strategy. That absolutely turns me off. The whole concept is repulsive. We don't do things like that. We look at the economic long-term possibilities. That focus on long-term value paid off. In 1980, the New York Times wrote that while other conglomerates were selling off diseased acquisitions from the 1960s, Teledyne was holding on to the strong portfolio Singleton had chosen and that Singleton himself was one of the best managers of assets there is. When you look at Warren Buffett's shareholder meetings, it's obvious that he either followed Singleton's lead or at least came to the same conclusions himself. If it's not a good business at the core, then why bother investing? This mentality led Buffett to own Heinz, American Express, and Coca-Cola. Here are the questions that Singleton asked every single time he bought a company. One, is it profitable? Google, 
Apple, Chick-fil-A, these have wildly large profits. Singleton would have loved them. Is it growing? We've seen OpenAI grow like crazy. We saw White Claws explode with popularity. Needs to have a growth story as a part of it. And importantly, did it have a leading market share? Think Visa, think Taiwan Semiconductor. These are at the forefront of their industries and it's impossible to imagine someone taking that superiority away. All of these were important, Profitability was number one for Singleton. He would never acquire a company if it didn't have strong cash flow because he wanted to take that cash and use it to either acquire other companies or invest more aggressively into the growth of that company. So he would not have been a fan of Peloton or Airbnb or Pinterest because these companies cannot generate any sort of consistent profit. Cash flow is very different than reported earnings. Singleton cared about cash rather than total revenue and told Teledyne investors to get used to the fact that our quarterly earnings will jiggle. Our accounting is set to maximize cash flow, not reported earnings. If you look at Warren Buffett's shareholder letters, you get the exact same message. Don't pay attention to reported earnings. In his 1981 letter to shareholders, he wrote, our acquisition decisions will be aimed at maximizing real economic benefits, not at maximizing either managerial domain or reported numbers for accounting purposes. In the long run, management's stressing accounting appearance over economic substance usually achieve little of either. Accountants can push numbers around and make them look good, but if you're holding the company for the long term, like Singleton or Buffett, that doesn't really help you. Take a look at Buffett's 2009 report, where he lays out exactly what his acquisition criteria is for Berkshire Hathaway. He looks for big companies that are worth his time, demonstrated consistent earning power, good cash flow, good current management, a business that he understands, and a set price so he can make a decision on whether the business is over or undervalued. Sounds simple, right? Just pick clear winners. But that's easier said than done when every single day the market's going to tempt you with big sexy headlines, growth stories, and companies that promise a quick elevator up to the top floor. While Singleton focused on long-term value, he hated strict business plans for a very simple reason. He knew he couldn't predict the future. And he confronted this head on at a Teledyne annual meeting where he said, I know a lot of people have very strong and definite plans that they've worked out on all kinds of things, but we're subject to a tremendous number of outside influences and the vast majority of them cannot be predicted. So my idea is to stay flexible. That helped him pivot on big decisions when he needed to. For example, when one of his companies, Packard Bell, that focused on the consumer television market, was getting hammered by Japanese companies like Sony, Singleton was smart enough to see it was a losing battle and completely pulled them out of making TVs. Packard Bell refocused on making IBM compatible PCs that were sold in Sears and ended up becoming larger and more profitable. What Singleton did right was to not fall for the sunk cost fallacy. Just because he'd invested in the business, already had the assets in place, and was losing did not mean that he persisted against terrible odds. He cut his losses and moved on. Buffett summarized it beautifully. In the end, Singleton was 100% rational, and there are very few CEOs about whom I can make that statement. Buffett is also ruthlessly flexible. He usually holds onto a stock for a long time, but he wasn't afraid to dump 83 billion worth of Verizon in early 2022 after buying it just a year prior. The company had poor growth and he didn't like what he saw. Both of these men knew the most important thing to do if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. The third and most impressive thing that Singleton did was trust his own judgment, even when the entire market was screaming at him to do the opposite. Picture this, in the 1960s, Teledyne's stock was flying high. Singleton realized that he was sitting on a ton of value and a stock that was potentially a little overpriced. So what do you do? You sell your stock into cash or you use your stock to go and acquire other companies that generate cash flow. That's why he acquired 130 firms. We can make a lot of money. We make a lot of money now. That's nothing new. 
Companies sell stock all the time to finance acquisitions and will do it aggressively. But what made Singleton different was how he reacted when the tables turned in 1969. The entire market went down more than 35%, and investors particularly soured on conglomerates which they perceived to be relatively inefficient at allocating capital. Teledyne was the bellwether of conglomerates and took a massive hit. Their share price dropped from $40 to eight. But Singleton bet that the market had overcorrected, and he leaned hard into share buybacks. Teledyne ended up buying back almost 90% of their outstanding stock at those rock bottom prices. Singleton decided that this was the best course of action after surveying all the options that were available to him. Remember, he had a portfolio of companies that were still kicking off cash flow. But instead of acquiring other companies, he realized that his own stock was so undervalued that it offered the best return on his investment. At one point, some of Singleton's board members questioned his methods, wondering if the market knew something that they didn't. And Singleton said back, I don't believe all this nonsense about market timing. Just buy good value, and when the market is ready, that value will be recognized. Over the next 10 years, the market backed Singleton up. Teledyne's annual income went up 89%. Net income went up by 315%. And the same Teledyne stock that was $8 when Singleton made those buybacks rocketed to $175 per share. The buybacks made Teledyne an incredible 42% compounded annual return. Let's use some simple numbers to break down the brilliance of what Singleton did with those buybacks. Let's imagine you have a company and there's 100 total shares outstanding. And because these are singleton companies, they're profitable. They do $100 worth of profit. That means that effectively, each share of the company is entitled to $1 of profit. But if you were to buy back half of those shares as the company, having the total shares outstanding to 50, but still do those $100 worth of profit, then you're gonna do $2 of profit per share. Pretty good. But remember, Singleton bought back 90% of outstanding shares. So he actually went all the way down to 10 effective outstanding shares, still had his profit, and 10 x his profit per share. In hindsight, those numbers look clear and obvious, but in the moment, Singleton had to trust his own analysis over the sentiments of the market. Buffett followed a very similar playbook. In the 24 months after Lehman Brothers folded and the 2008 financial crisis kicked off, most of corporate America did the apparently logical thing. They tried to pay down their debts and safeguard resources. They were focused on survival. But at the same time, Buffett had his most active acquisition period ever. Buying up stock left, right, and center. Like Singleton in the early 70s, Buffett saw his opportunity and deployed capital just as everyone else was backing off. And there were great deals to be had. In his shareholder letter in 2008, Buffett wrote that the falling stock market does not bother Charlie and me. Indeed, we enjoy such price declines if we have funds available to increase our positions. If we wanted to sum up Buffett's position in one quote, it'd be this. Be cautious where others are greedy and greedy where others are cautious. Like Singleton, Buffett has also used stock buybacks when he believes that Berkshire Hathaway has been undervalued by the market. Berkshire spent nearly 20 billion more on buying back its own stock since 2018 than it did in building its massive investment in Apple in 2020. In total, Buffett has poured more than $51 billion into his buyback strategy since 2018, channeling his mentor, Henry Singleton. To be a great investor, it's not enough to just be right. If you're right when everyone else is, you're in the consensus and your returns will be relatively normal. The key is to make a right call when the market consensus is against you. Because then, if you're right, you'll make a killing. As we reach the end of a video like this, the beautiful thing to realize is that we don't need to compound our capital at 20% a year for decades in order to get a spectacular result. What we can do is maintain a flexible mindset 
search for arenas where we can invest that have long-term value. And in the few instances where our analysis has led us to have the greatest conviction in our investment, push our chips in and trust our guts. That's what Singleton did, that's what Buffett did, and that's what this channel is all about. Installing the skill sets that we will need to reach the highest levels of elite performance. What you do with that performance and the wealth that comes with it is up to you. Singleton bought some ranch land and retired to New Mexico before passing away in 1999. I don't actually know what Buffett does, but I know that his propaganda tells us that he still owns a house that he bought for $31,000 in Nebraska. Regardless, this channel will continue to teach you about the strategies of the elite and hone in on the timeless recipes that have worked decade after decade to build great businesses. If that's of interest to you, then you'll also enjoy our video about Steve Jobs. His hero, Edwin Land, built Polaroid, and Jobs took many of his strategies and recipes to build Apple. Check it out.